Hey there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back in the episode of Commander Cheapskate Game Reviews, and this is the episodes where we review various products related to the wargaming industry. So, with that being said, today what we're taking a look at is the 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy rules for the Bretonian Army for 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Now, this document actually comes from the Warhammer Armies Project. It is a blogger site that hosts free rules that is written by a man named Matthias Eliason. Matthias Eliason has created unofficial 8th edition rules for various factions from the Warhammer universe. So armies like Albion, Cathay, Kingdom of End, different groups like that. So because of that, what he decided to do was actually create a whole new series of documents for 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Basically updated the rules, made some massive rule changes and some updates to the gaming system. And at the same time, he also created army books for the different factions within that universe. And so today's video, we're going to take a look at the Army of Bretonia with their 9th edition rules. And actually, um, you guys have been long viewers of our channel. You would have seen my battle reports using a Bretonian army using 8th edition of rules for Bretonia. And those are exactly the same author who created those rules as well. So now we'll be talking about 9th edition rules today for the Bretonians, which is kind of nice because the Bretonians have never received an official document for their rules since I think the 6th edition of Warhammer Fantasy. So it's actually kind of interesting to see exactly how this will develop. So during the course of this video, we will be talking about things like the army rules, we'll talk about special characters, magic as well as magical items, army lists, and our overall impression of the army book. And this video is going to be a little bit longer in length because we're doing a full in-depth analysis of the rules. So because of that, I will put timestamps down in the description box below so that way you guys can click on the various sections that just pertain to your interests. So with that being said, let's get this video report on a roll. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about for this army real quick is the army rules real quick. So let's go ahead and scroll through the document. As you see, it's got awesome artwork inside of it and actually a very beautiful job with a desktop publishing on this. In case if you weren't even aware, you would actually think this is actually a legitimate Games Workshop product. That's how much effort and work that Matthias Elias and put directly into this document. So if we go to our table of contents here, we're going to talk about specifically the Muster of Bretonia, which is the Army's special rules. Now, if you want to learn more about the fluff and the narrative behind the Bretonians, um, you can, of course, download this document yourself and take a look at that if you're interested in that sort of thing. One of the nice things about uh, Matthias Elias is that he does pay a lot of attention to the lore of the different armies that he works with and kind of like creates the essence of what they're about. So in this edition of Warhammer Fantasy uh, for the 9th edition, he basically made them back how they were, um, narratively speaking anyways, the fifth and sixth, fourth and fifth editions of Warhammer Fantasy, back where they're more like more chivalry, uh, more chivalry was involved. They're more heroic. Uh, they're not as exploitative as they used to be in other editions of Warhammer Fantasy. It's like they're going back to their source materials of Bretonian uh, with the Arthurian legend from England, for example. That's what they did for that one. <clears throat> so, talking about our army list real quick, let's go into our army special rules. And let's go ahead and zoom in and talk about the different rules. So first of all, we have Lance Formation. So the Lance Formation has returned on this one. Uh, pretty much what ends up happening is that monstrous ranks and monstrous cavalry apply to Bretonian knights in Lance Formation as well. And uh, basically must be three wide and up to five ranks deep. They talk about where you can place your damsels and prophetesses, which basically remain the same as before. At the same time, it says on the turn that unit in the Lance Formation charges, the models of this rule have the Devastating Charge Special Rule. So they get that right off the bat when they go in. It says in addition, all knight models on the flanks of the second and third rank of the unit follow the rules for supporting cac that apply to monstrous cavalry so they get their full attacks there and it says this counts as being in the front rank for the purposes of resolving impact hits and it says when removing casualties from the lance formation rank and file models are always removed from the center back rank before removing these on the flanks so we see a little bit of an update there for the lance formation which is really cool as well and of course we got some updates for the vows of bretonia so we have the peasants duty it says, uh, models of the peasants duty treat all friendly models with the Grail Vow, the Questing Vow, or the Grail Vow within six inches of them as having the Inspire Presence rule. So that's kind of nice. They could actually take um, leadership tests based on the knights, uh, knights that are near them. And it says, in addition, units with standards do not confer additional victory points if captured. So, because they're peasants in that case. We then have the Knight's Vow as well. It says, Niles of the Knight's Vow have immunity to panic caused by friendly models, and they can only be joined by characters with the Knight's Vow. <clears throat> then we have Questing Vow. It says, Questing Vows have immunity to panic caused by friendly units. 
They may be rolled psychology tests and may only join units with a knight's vow or questing vow. In addition, they ignore initiative penalties from using great weapons in any turn that they charge, but they may not use any lances. So that's actually kind of cool because the new rules now with the great weapons means that great weapon wielders suffer minus two to their initiative, and that is no longer the case with these guys. So that part is really cool. All the benefit, none of the penalty. That's assuming, of course, that you charge in a combat. Then we have the uh, Grail Vow. So with these guys, they have immunity to psychology. They also have magical attacks and also can only join units with uh, Knight's Vow, Questing Vow, or Grail Vow. And it says characters of the Grail Vow add plus one to their leadership. And of course, we have the Blessing of the Lady. You pretty much get a six award save all the time. At the same time, it's increased to five award save against missile attacks. And you have this blessing until you flee for any reason or refuse a challenge. So. That's what we have there for the Blessings of the Lady. So those are our army rules for that section. And moving on now to our Bretonian Lords. As you can see, we have our stats relatively stay the same. Same thing with their different special rules, so not much change has happened there. For our Damsels of the Lady, we have our Prophetesses as well as our Damsels. Uh, they are wizards who use the Lore of Life, Lore of Beasts, Lore of Heavens, Lore of Light, or the Lore of the Lady. So now they actually have their own magical system called the Lore of the Lady on that one. At the same time, damsels have a magic resistance of 1, and prophetesses have a magic resistance of 2, so that's good. We also have a brand new character type called Templar Crusaders. Now, Templar Crusaders have weapon skill 4, strength and toughness of 4 apiece, 2 wounds, 4 initiative, 2 attacks, leadership 8. They have the Blessing of the Lady, as well as the Knight's Vow, and the Last Formation Special Rule, but now they have what's called Fiery Zeal, and basically it says the Templar Crusader, any unit he gains, gains the Hatred Special Rule, for as long as he remains in the unit. So now we have uh, that being changed. So it's actually kind of interesting because in the original um, 8th edition document that they actually had for these guys, Fiery Zeal allowed you to reroll failed charges with your knights if he was mounted. So it looks like they no longer have that rule. So moving on, we have the Priestesses of Shayala. Um, two weapon skill, two blitz of skill, three strength and toughness, two wounds. So they're not really made for combat. However, they have healing hands. It says the unit the priestess is with, but not herself, gains a 6 up region save. They also have the pacifist rule. A priestess may be placed in the second rank of any infantry unit she joins rather than the first. And of course she has her bound spells, all augments, power level 3. We have Shayala's Endurance, which basically means that the unit she is with gets plus 1 toughness until the start of the next magic phase. Very powerful. We have Martyrdom. Which basically says the priestess creates a sympathetic connection between her and one of her friendly character of your choice within 12 inches. All wounds caused on the chosen character are ignored and the priestess suffers a strength 3 hit with no saves allowed for each wound suffered instead of instead. And this is remain in play bound, bound spell. And then finally we have purify. All hex spells affecting friendly units within 12 inches are automatically dispelled. In addition, any undead or demonic units in base contact with the priestess or the unit she is with takes d6 strength 5 hits that's a pretty interesting rule there we have there as well then we have the knights errant of course and uh, knights errant have the same kind of stats that they did before they also have their impetuous tests which means they must declare a charge they fill a leadership test and they must charge forward and they're also immune to psychology you may reroll one of their of their uh, distance dice as well you do have the errantry banner that they can take which is a magical standard and it says all knights errant in the unit gain a plus one strength bonus on any turn they charge, however, a unit with this banner suffers minus two to its leadership for any impetuous tests as well. So these guys would be leadership five when you take that. But with the bonus strength, it's kind of worth it, all things considered. Then of course we have our Knights of the Realm, which are the bread and butter for this unit. Relatively stay the same with all their stats, so no changes there really. And we also have our Questing Knights, so those guys are back, and of course they're packing great weapons for them. And we talked a little bit about them with their, uh, with their uh, Questing Vow. 4 weapon skill, 4 strength, these guys will have strength 6 on their first round of combat and strength 5 in subsequent rounds of combat, so very cool. And of course we have our Grail Knights, our Grail Knights here look like that weapon skill 5, strength and toughness 4, that's really nice, as well as 2 attacks base, so very cool there, and their attacks are magical attacks too, which is actually kind of cool, so kudos to the Grail Knights. And then of course we have Pegasus Knights, everyone loves those guys, so as you can see here, uh, those guys are still around as well. We also have our Royal Pegasi, which are War Beasts, and of course they have their stats as well. So looking good there. And we have a brand new unit now called Hippogriff Knights. So Hippogriff Knights are actually a rare choice unit that you use. They're actually rare. Uh, they're actually rare choices, and they're monstrous cavalry now. So the Bretonians now have access to monstrous cav. Uh, the Hippogriff has a strength of five, a toughness of four. 
Hypocrite Knights have Strength of 4 as well and 1 attack, condition of 4. 3 attacks and 3 wounds for the Hippogriff as well and they also got Monsters Calvary, which is very cool. And then of course we have our, uh, they also got Fly too, so that's a really cool thing. Flying Monsters Calvary is all kinds of awesome. And then we also have what's called Royal Hippogriffs. These are your monster, monster net mounts that can be taken by your various knights. They have Shredding Talons, Serrated Maw, Swooping Strike, as well as Blood Rage upgrades that you can purchase for them as well. All right, so it looks like we have a brand new unit for these guys called Foot Knights now. So as you can see here, we have Foot Knights. Um, they got weapon skill four, three across their stats, uh, three initiative, one attack, leadership eight. Uh, they have the Blessings of Lady as well as a Knight's Vow. So now we have a little bit more powerful infantry choices in our army. We of course have our minute arms, and these guys are actually kind of nice because they actually got quite a bit of an upgrade from previous editions. Uh, they're actually just basic infantry now. Weapon skill 3, blizzard skill 3, 3 strength and toughness, 3 initiative, 1 attack. However, they do have leadership 6, so they're still pretty poor in terms of leadership. But because they have the peasants duty, they can take inspiring presence leadership abilities from any knights that happen to be nearby. Which would actually be kind of cool because if you were to use these guys in conjunction with um, foot knights, they actually get a leadership 8, which is actually kind of good. So not so bad there. That's actually pretty awesome to see that. We also have our Peasant Bowmen as well. So Peasant Bowmen have Weapon Skill 2, but they're now Ballista Skill 3 is what they have. And they also have Leadership 5, so they're actually even worse than their men at arms. But they also have Defensive Stakes they can take, and it says every model in the front rank has it is, as a stake base place in front of it. Defensive Stakes are treated as defended obstacles and remain on the table during the game. All true types apart from infantry and swarm suffer D6 strength 4 hits on the turn that they charge a unit behind defensive stakes. In addition, enemy models in base contact with the defensive stakes suffer a minus 1 to hit in the first round of close combat. These rules only apply when finding the unit's front rank. So, pretty interesting there with our defensive ranks that we're seeing for those guys. <clears throat> so moving on, we also have Peasant Mob. Now these guys are what the old Bretonian peasants used to look like with 4 weapon skill and then weapon sk uh, 4 movement. Weapon skill and blitz skill 2 with a 4 of leadership, so these guys are even worse off than goblins with their stats, which is actually kind of interesting to see that. Then we also have a new unit called Truffle Hounds, and these are war beasts, and they actually have frenzy. Weapon skill 3, 3 strength and toughness, 3 initiative, 1 attack. And it looks like these guys are kind of treated like fanatics. It says a unit with one or more Truffle Hounds must place them in the front rank of the unit along with any command group models and or characters. They may be attacked separately from other models in the unit. If the, unit, uh, if the unit they are with did not themselves declare a charge this turn, the Trouble Hounds may be released in the charge sub-phase of the move phase and do not need a test for break Berserk Rage. The Trouble Hounds must then declare a charge as if they have failed their Berserk Rage test. After they have been released, they will automatically form their own unit of skirmishers. From that point, they will keep having to declare charges as if they have failed their Berserk Rage whenever possible for the rest of the game. Your opponent will only receive victory points for Trouble Hounds if the unit they were bought with is destroyed. So these guys kind of like are interesting. They kind of act like fanatics a little bit in the sense that they can kind of intercept enemy attacks, um, enemies charging into you, so that's kind of nice as well. However, they did take away the random attacks for that one. They just gave them Frenzy instead because in the 8th edition rules, they actually had like a number of random attacks they could do. So it looks like they only gave them Frenzy. So there's a little bit of a change there from the previous edition. Then we have Yeoman, of course. Uh, these are your guys' fast cab. They're all, they also have the Peasant's Duty, so their rules have relatively stayed the same. Same thing with Squires, these guys are also skirmishers as well, um, they relatively stay the same as well, so no change there. We also now have Grail Pilgrims, which are uh, from the older edition of Warhammer Fantasy. So these guys have uh, Hatred, they also got the Peasant's Duty as well as Stubborn. They got mediocre stats, but they have Leadership 8, so that's actually pretty good there. They also have the Grail Reliquary, which says the Holy Shrine must always be placed in the center of the front rank of the unit. Once, Only once all the Grail Pilgrims in the unit, except the command group, are removed, does the Reliquary itself start taking wounds. In addition, the presence of the Grail Reliquary means that the entire unit will be affected by the blessings of the Lady. So, kind of like an interesting way to have uh, some shock troops if you want to have them in there. Then we have what's called Haramults, or what those guys are called. They're basically scouting archers, is what they are. So here's our scouting. They have scouts and skirmishers. There are also archers that you can take. We also have Faceless, which are pretty much like assassin characters. They also have the Scout and Snapper rule as well. So these are hero characters that you can take, which is a brand new unit that you can have in this army. Another one, of course, is Brigands. And Brigands are basically mercenaries. Uh, so as you can see, they got pretty much basic stats for the most part. And the reason why you take these guys is not necessarily for their stats, it's because of the equipment choices they can take. And uh, we'll go a little bit more in detail with those when we get to the actual army list uh, for those guys. 
So continuing on, War Machines. We actually have quite a bit of change now for the War Machines in this edition. So they can now take Ballistas, which are basically bolt throwers. They can take those. They can take Mangonels, which are basically like stone throwers and catapults. We also have Field Trebuchets, which have always been a part of the unit. So the Field Trebuchet has relatively stayed the same as well. <clears throat> And we have now Bombard, so these guys can now take cannons in their unit as well. So there we go, so now they can take cannons as well for the uh, Bretonians now with these Bombard rules. And also as an added bonus for all these War Machines, you can upgrade your crew members to be a Wall Warden. And Wall Wardens have this special rule, a War Machine with a Wall Warden may reroll one artillery dice or to fail to hit roll once per game. So in case you have some bad luck, you can use these instead to get that uh, luck back again. Now we have a brand new unit for this edition called the Spirits of the Fey, and the Spirits of the Fey are infantry, they have the animated crunch truck special rule, they are ethereal, they also cause fear, they're also unstable, have a ward save of 5 up, 4 weapon skill, 3 stats for everything else, 1 wound, 1 attack, leadership 10, and it says Guardians of the Sacred Sites, Spirits of the Fey are not deployed with the rest of the army, but follow the entry rules for ambushers instead. When they appear, they must be placed in either a forest or a water feature anywhere on the table, but otherwise follow the rules for ambushers as normal. If no forest or water feature are present, they may enter from any table edge using the normal rules. As long as a unit of Spirits of the Fae remain partially within one of these terrain features, they may replace up to D3 wounds lost earlier in the game to the end of the each close combat phase. So these guys are kind of like your, uh, kind of like your ethereal, kind of like spirit hosts almost. They're kind of deadly that way as well. But... They also kind of nerfed these guys a little bit too because now we have a unit cap and we'll talk about that when we get to the army lists. So from there we have the Sanctum, uh, Sacro Sanctum of the Lady, which is a new War Shrine ability we have. It's also a chariot. It's, uh, as you can see, you got Strength 4, Toughness 5, 5 Wounds. As you can see here, it's got Immunity, Psychology, a 4 Ward Save, and a level 2 Magic Resistance. And it says the San uh, Sacro Sanctum knows these three, three blessings listed below. Blessings are innate balance spells of power level 5, for each friendly Sacro Sanctum on the battlefield at the start of your magic phase, add one dice to your power pool. We have Shield of Faith, which affects all friendly units within 12 inches. Until the start of your next turn, the targets have their ward save increase from the Blessing of the Lady up to 1. It's a very powerful ability. We also have Radiant Light, which is a hex spell. It affects all enemy units within 12 inches. Until the start of your next turn, the target suffers minus 1 to their weapon skill and ballistic skill and their renewed valor is an augment spell that affects all friendly units with the blessing of the lady rule up to 12 inches away. All fleeing friendly knights within 12 inches will automatically and regain the blessing of the lady. So that's pretty cool there too. And of course we have a rules for Bretonian war horses. They have what's called purebred war horses, which means they don't suffer any movement penalties for having barding, which is really nice as well. We also have unicorns, which have stayed the same. And then we have our special characters. So we'll go ahead and talk about those guys here next. Okay, so in this section we'll be talking about the special characters for the Bretonians. The first up is Lewin Leoncour, or the Lionheart, which is the King of Bretonia. As you can see, pretty modest uh, skill ability here, as well as the ability to ride a Hippogriff. Uh, the Hippogriff actually is an optional character mount, so you actually have to pay points for in order to ride that Hippogriff as well. As you can see, he's got the Grail Val, Lance Formation, Blessing of the Lady. He's got the Virtue of the Lionheart, which means you roll a D3 at the beginning of each close combat phase and add the score to Lewin's strength for the duration of that phase. So very good in close combat. He also has a Lady's Champion rule, which means it's a 4 region save. However, if he loses the Blessing, he will immediately lose a wound <clears throat> with no armor saves allowed. He's got the Sword of Coron. The sword allows Lewin to reroll failed rolls to hit. In addition, the enemy models in base contact with Lewin at the beginning of any close combat phase must take an initiative test. If that test has failed, the model may make no attacks this round and will be hit automatically. So really cool for challenges and the like. Then we have the Lion Lance. Uh, each successful hit with the Lion Lance is multiplied into two hits. The Lance can only be used when charging. In other rounds of combat, Lewin will use the Sword of Coron. Then we have the Armor of Brilliance, it's magic armor, heavy armor, opponents will suffer a minus one to all hit rolls to hit the wearer with missile weapons and in close combat. We then also have the Lion Shield as well, it basically gives Luan a magic resistance equal to the total number of dice used in casting of the enemy spell to a maximum of three, so very nice there. We also have the Tabard of Kings, any enemy spell that targets Luan or the unit he is with and is successfully cast inflicts D3 strength four hits on the wizard that casts the spell. So cool there and then we also have the crown of bretonia 
Lewin's Inspiring Presence rule has an extra 6 inches in range. In addition, all friendly units that may use Lewin's leadership have immunity to panic. So very cool there as well. Then we have Morgiana Le Fay. She's the Fay Enchantress. This is the magical spell-wielding uh, special character as well. She looks like she has her Supreme Aura of the Lady. She has uh, Magic Resistance 3 and Fear Special Rules. Against Skaven, Orcs, and Goblins of Beastmen, she causes terror. Furthermore, she gains plus 2 to cast spells from the Lore of Life or the Lore of the Lady. Looks like she has the Favor of the Fey. One friendly character with either the Knight's Vow, Questing Vow, or the Grail Vow may be given the Favor of the Fey before the game starts, but after deployment is finished. This model receives plus 1 to hit in close combat. However, if the model loses the Blessing of the Lady, then both the Favored Model and the Fey Enchantress suffer a wound with no armor saves. And then we have the Supreme Blessing of the Lady. Such as the power of the Fey Enchantress, the ward save gained from the Blessing of the Lady is increased by a plus 1 for any unit that she has the Blessing of the Lady and is joined by the Fey Enchantress. So it looks like she rides a unicorn named Silveron, who's got the Impale Magical Attacks, she's got the Chalice of Potions, the Morgiana's Mirror, the Girdle of Gold, and Toad Familiar. So for the Chalice of Potions, it looks like the Fey may appear into the Chalice and stir up magical powers used against her foes. Roll a d6, and each time the chalice is used, the number refers to which spell is automatically cast from the Lord of the Lady as a bound spell, at the power level equal to the minimum casting value for the spell. This requires no power dice and cannot be increased in any way. However, if a 6 is rolled, the chalice runs out of power. Pretty cool there. And Morgiana's Mirror says, At the start of the enemy magic phase, the Fey Enchantress may choose one enemy wizard on the battlefield. Against this wizard, she will get a 2 up to dispel for the remainder of the turn. For the Girdle of Gold, she gets a 4 of Ward save, and for the Toad Familiar, she adds 1 dice to both the Power, Dice, and Dispel dice pool each magic phase. So yeah, pretty powerful abilities that she gets there as well. Then we have the Green Knight, he makes a comeback again. Um, as you can see, he's got his Ward save 5 up, causes terror, he's ethereal, unstable. Gardens of the Sacred Sites again, looks like he's got the Aura of the Fey. If his wound value is ever reduced to zero, he will immediately disappear into thin air. However, in the remaining remove phase of the following Bretonian player's movement phase, the Bretonian player may attempt to reawaken the Green Knight as described in the Guardians of the Sacred Sites above, following all the same rules. However, each time the Green Knight is slain, a minus one is suffered for each of the next die roll to awaken him. And of course, he's got the Dolorous Blade, which gives him either a d6 extra attacks or can add plus two to his strength. So, very, very cool with his character. Then, of course, we have some more new special characters that don't Beaumont, the Beast Slayer, the Duke of Baston. Uh, as you can see here, he's got his Beast Slayer, which means he has hatred against orcs and goblins, beastmen, and Skaven. He's also got the Beast Mace of Baston, which gives him two up strength and multiple wounds of two. And Beaumont Shield, which basically says on a roll of six, the enemy weapon is snapped in two and uh, can't be used anymore. Pretty cool there. We have Tancred II, the second, the coot of the Duke of Quigné. I believe is how you pronounce that. I'm not really good on my French pronunciation of words, so I do apologize for that. Um, looks like he's got the virtue of purity as well as the Grail Vow. He's got the Blade of Banishment. Sword wounds with the model with undead special rule automatically with no armor saves allowed. Also causes immunity from terror caused by undead, so very cool. He's got the Grail Shield, forces of destruction based contact with Tancred, suffers minus one to hit in close combat, and the Blessed Draft, uh, when used only, Tancred may drink this potion at the beginning of any player's turn, and for the duration of that turn, he has strength uh, by d6, so very cool there. Then we have Raponce de Lioness, I believe is how you pronounce that, with D and Lioness. Uh, Lionesse, maybe? I'm not sure. Uh, so as you can see here, she's the Battle Center Bear. Um, she's got the Knight's Vow Lance Formation. She can cause Terra Magic Resistance 3. All the magical weapons are mundane weapons with the Sword of Lioness, I believe, or Lioness. And she has the Fleur de Lee banner, and the Magic Phase of Italian player may remove one power die from the enemy and add to their Dispel Pool. So, pretty impressive there, all things considered. Then we have Armand de Aquitaine, the Duke of Aquitaine, I believe how you pronounce that. Uh, looks like he's another battle center bear. He's got the virtue of knightly ardor, which means an Armand in the unit he is with may respond to a charge to his unit's front by countercharging if he can pass leadership test and roll higher than the enemy for the charge distance. If he succeeds, count the enemy's charge as a failed one and move more Armand's units as per normal charges. He has the banner of the lady. It says all enemy units in base contact with the bearer of the banner of the lady get no combat bonuses for ranks. Oof, that is exceptionally brutal for that one. Then we have Tristan and the Troubadour, and Jules the Jester. So those guys are actually from the 4th edition of Warrior Fantasy Battle, if I remember correctly. 
So that's actually kind of cool for these characters here. We have the Val uh, Valorious Ballads. Uh, it says, until you have Tristan and the the same song or choose another. Oh, it looks like he's got bounce bells. So the Battle Hymn of Quinye, I, I believe it's how you pronounce that. While singing this song, Tristan adds plus three D3 combat res. Oh, nice. The Grail Chorel. While he sings this song, the ward save from the Blessing Ladies increased by plus one. And then we have the Anthem of the Uniter. Tristan and any unit he has joined are stubborn while he sings this ballad. Oh, very cool. And then we have Once Trample, Twice Shy. Jules must deploy the six inch of Tristan at the start of the game, but may move freely after this. He may join units with the Peasant's Duty, but he may not join units with the Knightly Vow of any kind. He's got a two of ward save against all non-magical attacks. Very cool. And I will taunt you viciously a second time. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the guy from uh, from Knights of the Whole, uh, from uh, the uh, Monty Python's um, from Monty Python right there. Oh my goodness, the quest of the quest for the Holy Grail. Oh my God. Okay, so it says, enemy models unfortunate enough to be within six inches of jewels suffers a minus one penalty to hit rolls in close combat. <laughs> and I shall make fun of you again. Okay, so there we have that one. Interesting. We have Otto D. The Ultrame, I believe how you pronounce that, and Slimon the Saracen. Uh, these guys will look like they're 4th edition heroes as well. Both of them are Knights Vow with a virtue of confidence. War of the Sands, if you choose to include Otto uh, in your army with Slimon, will also come to the battle as Otto's retainer. Otto and Slimon always move and fight together as a team and may join you as you wish. Slimon is a blood curling war cry unique to the tribe of Araby from which he comes. Slimon causes fear. In any turn that he charges. We also have the Morning Star of Fracasse, I believe is how you pronounce that. The Morning Star gives the bearer strength bonus two special roll for each hit in a close combat opponent. Roll a d6 on a four, but the opponent has a magic weapon is destroyed. And then we have the Gauntlet of the Duel. Any challenges issued by the bearer, the Gauntlet of the Duel cannot be refused. So that one comes back again. And then we have Sir Almeric of Gaderon, I believe is how you pronounce that. Bane of the Undead. So I'm assuming this guy is an anti undead character. <laughs> He's got the Bane of the Undead. It looks like any units with the Undead special rule and base contact with Almeric at the start of the combat phase automatically suffer D6 wounds, which ignore armor saves. These wounds count towards combat resolution. Very interesting. And the Icon Lady gives him a magic resistance one and a four of ward save. And then we have the Hermit Knight of Melmont, which looks like is a new character. It looks like he's a Grail Knight. Oh, Grail Knight, Knight. so very cool there. Virtue of the Penitent. He's got the Sword of Virtue, it's a great weapon. The Sword of Virtue allows the Hermit Knight to reroll rule, re -roll rolls of one to hit into wound. In addition, has multiple wounds, D3, special rule, very cool. And the Flask of Snapdragon, uh, so sorry, of Song Dragon. It says the Hermit Knight can drink this wine at the beginning of any combat phase. His strength is increased by D3 for the duration of the phase. As the Knight always tends to gulp it down, he can only use the Flask three times per game. <laughs> Oh, okay, so, yeah. Okay, alcoholic drunk knight with swords. That's that's really cool. Then we have Bertrand the Brigand. This guy's back. That's awesome. Bertrand the Brigand was a Robin Hood-inspired character from the fourth edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Looks like he's back. Yep, he's got Hugo Le Petit as well as Gris Le Gros, which is his, uh, like, Little John and, and Friar Tuck. So we have those characters again. So it says, Marksman. Bertrand has a sniper special rule. I may reroll to hit with missile weapons. Hugo Le Petit, all bow shots made by Hugo. Or resolve that strength five rather than three. And then Gui Le Gros, uh, as long as Gui Le Gros is alive, the unit he is with may reroll fail leadership tests. We have the Bozeman of Bergerac. The Bowmen of Bergerac are a unit of Hemeralds with plus one ballistic skills. Bertrand, Hugo, and Gui must set up with this unit and may not leave it. No other character may join the unit. And then we have the Black Arrow, which is an enchanted item. One use only, the Black Arrow wounds automatically if it hits. It has the following profile. Strength the three ignores armor saves. Eh. Eh, it's okay. And then with that, we go directly to the magic phase with the Lore of the Lady. So we'll talk about that next. All right, so for this section, we'll be talking about the magic lore they can use as well as their magical items. So they actually have a brand new lore for them, which is the Lore of the Lady. For their lore attribute, they got Favor of the Lady. If a spell from the Lore of the Lady is successfully cast on a friendly unit, it may reroll ones for ward saves from the Blessing of the Lady until the start of the next Plutonium Magic Phase. So pretty modest um, lore attribute there. So our signature spell is Steve the Lady, cast on a 5-up. 
is an augment spell with a range of 18 inches. The target unit will have movement 10 and cants as ethereal for the purposes of movement until the start of the next Bretonian magic phase. This spell has only an effect on mounted knights. The caster can choose to increase the range of this to 36 inches. If they do so, the casting value is increased to 8 up. Then the uh, level 1 spell is the Mist of Shalom with uh, cast on a 6 up. It is a remain in play spell. It's an augment spell that targets the wizard in any unit he is they are with. Until the start of the caster's next magic phase, all enemy missile attacks targeting them suffer a minus one to hit penalty. The wizard can choose to extend the range of the spell to target all friendly units within six inches. If they do so, the casting value is to a 12 plus. So very powerful ability, especially if you're worried about being shot at. Then we have the Doom of Dole, which is a cast on a seven plus, remains in play spell. Doom of Dole is a spell with a range of 24 inches. Name one enemy model to be doomed and one friendly character with any vow within range to slay him. While the spell is active, the chosen knight will wound that model on a 2 plus with ignore armor save special rules. The caster can choose to increase the range of the spell to 40 inches. If they do so, the casting value is increased to 10 plus. So, so far, these spells are actually pretty good. Their boosted versions are actually very attainable, which is actually kind of interesting to see for this lore. Then we have the Beguilement of Blondel. It's a cast up on a 9 plus. It's a remaining play spell. The Beguilement of Blondel is a hex spell with a range of 24 inches. The target unit must pass a leadership test or count as having failed a stupidity test. If they are in close combat, they will have their weapon skill lowered to 1 instead. For as long as the spell is active, all enemy units must keep taking this leadership test at the start of each turn. The caster can choose to increase the range of the spell to 48 inches. If they do so, the casting value is, is increased to 10 up. Wow, pretty powerful ability right there too. And a pretty low casting value, all things considered. Then we have the level 4 spell, Wrath of Righteousness, cast on a 10+. plus. It is a direct damage spell that targets all enemy units within 12 inches of the caster. All target units suffer D6 strength 4 hits with the lightning attack special rule, and the caster can choose to increase the range of this spell to target all enemies within 18 inches, and they do so the casting value is increased to 15 plus. Very powerful way to soften up your enemy before finishing them off in close combat. Level, <laughs> this is my favorite spell, level 5 spiteful glance, let's talk about this one. This is cast on an 11 plus. It's a hex spell with a range of 12 inches that targets a single model, even a character in a unit. If the spell is successfully cast, the enemy must take an initiative test in order to avoid being turned into a frog. If it fails, they are transformed and cannot do anything except croak and hop around for the rest of the game. Remove this model as a casualty with no saves allowed except magic resistance. Ooh, that's a really powerful, powerful spell. You could definitely use that on things like steam tanks, for example, and cause all kinds of chaos. Oh, very, very cool there. Especially since the initial value on a sea take is really, really bad. So that's a pretty cool spell. So nicely done. In the uh, old edition, uh, eighth edition rules for this set, you can only use it on characters. So, woo, really powerful ability on that one. And then level six, we have the Lady's Virtue of Valor, cast on a 12 plus. The Lady's Virtue of Valor is an augment spell with a range of 12 inches. Roll a d6, and the result rolled as a number of characteristics the target may increase by one in the following order. Weapon skill, initiative, strength, toughness, attacks, and leadership. The effect lasts until the start of the next magic caster's magic phase. The caster can choose to let, it, uh, to let the unit roll 2d6 and pick the highest result instead. If they do so, the casting value is increased to an 18+. Very powerful ability there as well. So the Lord of the Lady, very, very cool. Now, we also have some Virtues of Chivalric Knights. So we do have Virtues. Virtues are a game mechanic that make a return for this edition. So it says only well, more than one character may have the same virtue, but to represent the rarity of this, any character that takes a virtue another character already has must pay double the points of the last or below. If a third character takes the same virtue, they must play triple and so on. So the knight, ooh, wow, Virtue of Heroism is now 35 points now. So that's perfect. It gives you heroic killing blow. And so very cool there. We have the Virtue of Stoicism, which is 35 points. The knight and any unit has joined rolls 3d6 for all leadership tests and discards the highest. Very cool. We got the Virtue of the Impetuous Knight at 30 points. The knight and any unit he is, um, mount, mounted unit he is with adds d3 to their charge distance. We have the Virtue of the Ideal, which is worth 30 points. The knight gains the following bonuses to his profile, plus two weapon skill, plus one initiative, plus one attack. He may not be the army's general, and any friendly unit, including other knightly characters or units using a knight's leadership, taking any form of leadership test within the six inches of this model suffer a minus one penalty to the leadership. Well, I guess that makes sense because, you know, it's like, ooh, look, he's so cool. Then we have Virtue of Audacity. Worth 30 points. Against enemies of the higher strength than himself, the knight may reroll any failed rolls to hit and to wound. 
Hmm, pretty cool. Which is pretty much all the time. You have uh, Virtue of Nightly Temper, which is worth 25 points. For each attack the knight hits and wounds with on the charge, after saves, he may make additional attacks. Extra attacks are not generated if these additional attacks also hit and wound. Oh, pretty cool there. Then with the Virtue of Duty, as long as the general is alive, the model of the Virtue adds plus one to the combat resolution of any fight of which he is part. He may not be taken by a general. Very cool. Yeah, I like using this one a lot. I actually have a battle center bear that I used this with the war banner, so that way they had a static three combat resolution in their charges because of the battle center bear. So, very cool virtue there. We have the virtue confidence, which is worth 25 points. The knight must always issue and accept challenges if possible. And in the challenge, the knight may reroll re all failed rolls to hit and to wound. Then we have the Virtue of Penitent, uh, 20 points. The Knight is stubborn, though he may never join any friendly units. Oh, that's kind of sad. We also got the Virtue of the Joust, which is worth 20 points. The Knight may reroll uh, re re failed rolls, there we go, to hit when charging and or using a lance, including magical lances. Ooh, might be pretty cool to use that. Virtue of Purity, which is 15 points. The Knight gains a plus one bonus to the award save from the Blessing of the Lady. We have the Virtue of Noble Disdain, worth this worth 15 points. The knight hates all enemies using missile weapons, including war machine crews. In addition, any unit the knight has joined never takes panic test cause by suffering 25% casualties from shooting or magic. Virtue of Discipline worth 15 points. Enemies can never claim the outnumber bonus against the knight and any unit he's with. And the Virtue of Empathy worth 10 points. If the knight is not the army's general, models with the peasant's duty within 12 inches of him treat him as having the inspiring presence rule. If he is the army's general, his inspiring presence rules instead increase to 18 inches for models with the peasant duty. And in addition, he may not join. He may join units with the peasant's duty. Oh, very cool there as well. So with that, we go directly to the magical items. So we have the silver lance of the blessed, which is a 70 point magical item. It's a weapon. Uh, it's a lance. If the model with the blessing of the lady, then all attacks of the silver lance of the blessed automatically hit. Nice. In addition, all successful enemy armor saves and war saves must be re-rolled. However, if the model wielding the lance flees for any reason, he suffers d6 flaming attack strength 4 hits with the Norse armor save rule. Zzz. Man, the lady don't play around, does she? Then we have the sword of heroes with 40 points against enemies that have toughness 5 or greater. The bear gains plus 2 strength and multiple d3 wounds. Special rule. Very cool. We have the Sword of Ladies Champion, which is 30 points. Character with the Grail Vow only. The character always counts their strength as one higher than their target's toughness, unless their strength would normally be uh, more than this. Yeah, that's a really cool magic item to use, especially against monsters. That thing is really, really awesome to use. Then we have the Caress of Fortune, which is worth 25 points. It's heavy armor. The knight may reroll ones when rolling to hit, to wound, and when making armor saves. They have Syrian's, lock, a Syrian's Locket, which is worth 55 points. Bretonian Lord only. A model with Syrian's Locket has immunity, killing blow, multiple wounds, and can never suffer more than one wound in any one phase. After the first wound in that phase is suffered, all subsequent wounds suffered during that phase are ignored. The bear may still not, uh, still be run down by pursuing enemies as normal, and may still be affected as normal by the other instant kill attacks. So, very cool right there. That makes your journal a little bit more survivable. Then we have uh, the Silver Mirror with 45 points, uh, one use only. When used, the bear of the Silver Mirror deflects a spell cast at her or the unit she is with back at the enemy caster. The enemy can try to dispel their own spell as normal using any remaining power dice or dispel dice. This item has no effect on spells that do not specifically target the bear or the unit she is with. Then we have the Chalice of Malfleur, which is worth 15 points. At the start of the opponent's magic phase, the bear may drink from the chalice. If she does so on the roll of one, she suffers a wound and no saves allowed, including war saves, but on a roll of two through six, extra dispel die is added to your player pool. Then we have the Tress of Isold, worth 15 points. One use only. Nominate one enemy model in base contact at the beginning of any close combat phase after challenges. The bear hits that model like two plus for that close combat round, regardless of other modifiers. So pretty nice. I can see this being really useful, especially in challenges. And then of course, lastly, we have the banner defense, which is worth 25 points. It's a magic standard. As long as the unit is affected by the blessings of the lady, all models in the unit with a bear or the banner gains a four up war save against all missile attacks, including magic missiles. If the blessing of the lady is lost, then the banner loses this ability too. Okay. So pretty powerful magic, especially powerful magic, as well as very powerful magical items as well. So the last thing we're going to talk about real quick is going to be the Bretonian Army List. 
All right, so the very last thing we're talking about real quick are the army lists for the Bretonians. So starting off with the Lords, uh, Lewin, Lewin Leoncourt, he's about 400 points base. Uh, you have to pay for either Barter Warhorse, Royal Pegasus, or his Hippogriff for additional points as well. So very expensive character for that one. Morgiana Lafay is a 460 points with her, and to ride her unicorn, she's looking at 25 points for that. The Green Knight's worth 700, uh, 275 points. Beaumont the Beast Slayer is 285. Tancred the Duke of Quigny, he is uh, 235 points for him. The Bretonian Lord's 110 points. Looks like he can take uh, all the different things you want to have for that character as well, which is pretty cool for him. Um, Questing Val and Grail Val, he also could take magic items and our virtues up to 100 points, so very cool there. We have our Prophetess of the Lady. Uh, she could either ride a Sanker Sectum of the Lady, or a Unicorn, or Royal Pegasus, which is kind of cool too, and a Border War Horse. So very cool, 175 points for her. Raponce de Leonese, or Leon Lioness, I believe I pronounce it. Uh, she's 85 points. Uh, must pay 16 points though, to ride a Border War Horse, so additional tax there. Armand de Aquitaine, 215 points for him. Otto, Otto de Outremer, and Suleiman the Saracen. 135 points, 85 points for him as well. Bertrand the Brigand is 140 points for his character too. And then we have Tristan the Troubadour as well as Jules the Jester, 145 and 30 points respectively. And then we have the, oh, looks like he can use a lance even though he has a questing vow. Looks like he still uses a lance, so very cool. So we have uh, Sir Almeric of Gaudron, uh, Gaudron, which is 175 points for him. The Hermit Knight of Malmont is 165 points. And of course, you have your paladins. You can be your army battle standard bearers. Uh, looks like he's 50 points, 60 points for that character. So pretty cool. Then we have the damsel, the lady. Oh, what's it here? Oh, okay. Looks like here. So it says the battle standard bearer can have a magic battle with no points limit. However, a model carrying a magic standard can only carry other magic items and or virtues up to 25 points. Oh, cool. So looks like he can carry a magic standard as well as additional magic items. So very cool there. Uh, we have the Damsel the Lady, worth 80 points for her. As you see, we have our different mounts for them. And then our Templar Crusader. I was kind of sad about this guy, though. So this guy's only 55 points. His Vary Zeal ability only gives you Hatred, which is kind of sad, so you don't get to reroll. However, though, he can take Magic Items and Virtues. So it looks like he can take Virtues now, so I guess that kind of has the payoff there. Then we have our Faceless character, worth 50 points, can take 25 points in Magic Items. The Priestess of Shyella. May take up to 50 points in enchanted items, talismans, as well as arcane items. So cool. And of course we have our uh, character mounts there as well. So moving on to our core units, looks like we have our Knights Errant with 21 points apiece. Uh, Energy Batters to 25. So cool there. Same thing with our Knights of the Realm, they get up to 25 points for their magic standard as well. So very cool. Then our Minute Arms. So it looks like our Minute Arms actually can take Medium Armor now, so they can have a 5 up armor save, which is kind of nice. So we can do that now with these guys. As well as clue clue up the three Truffle Hounds. Peasant Bowmen have the same thing for them. One point for Flaming stay, uh, Defensive Stakes. Looks like a half a point for Flaming Attacks. For Braziers, though, they can take Bucklers and Light Armor now. So very cool there. Peasant mob can be armed with flails. Oh, so you can actually make these guys actually strength, what, five? So that's pretty cool. Spears and shield slings are throwing weapons. So, wow, so these guys are actually not so bad. You could actually use them to uh, be like kind of like a suicide squad that you send them forward to like, you know, try to soften up your opponents with some high strength attacks. Pretty cool there. Then we have our questing knights. Look like they stay the same. Foot knights, looks like they carry great weapons and pole arms and shields. Magic stand up to 25 points, so cool for that. Then we have our Pegasus Knights, worth 50 points per model. And they can also take a magic standard, which is nice. Squires are worth 7. Yeomen, those guys are worth 10 points apiece, which is actually kind of cool. Looks like they can take spears, they can also take bows or crossbows, and shields. And it looks like you can upgrade them with medium armor too, makes them a little bit more survivable in close combat. So, that's actually pretty good. Uh, just because I like to use Yeoman for uh, flanking defenders uh, for my uh, columns of knights in our lance formations. Then it looks like we have Grail Pilgrims, worth 7 points apiece. Uh, upgrade 6 Grail Pilgrims to the Grail, Grail Reliquy. <laughs> Cost 3 points to do that. They got their uh, points there for there with hand weapons and shields. We have our Hemeralds, which are worth 8 points apiece. Looks like we have our Brigands, and this is the guys I was talking about earlier. So the reason why you take Brigands is not necessarily for their stats. That's not the thing you're taking them for. 
You're taking them because you can either replace their great weapons, either crossbows or handguns. And you can also upgrade them with medium armor too. So, ooh, that's actually kind of scary. A unit of medium armored, five up armor save, handgun wielding brigands. Ooh, that actually sounds pretty scary to take on. And then we have our rare units, of course. We have our Grail Knights. Uh, those guys worth 38 points apiece. We have our Hippogriff Knights, which are our monstrous flying cav. Uh, those guys can take barding as well and cost 25 points apiece. So very deadly there. So our Spirits of the Fae, you can have a unit up to 30 people. So that was the thing I was talking about earlier. They kind of capped it to where the maximum size you can have for that unit is worth 30, point, 30, uh, 30 people. So that's actually still quite a bit considering they're worth 115 points per model. So... Very large there. Then we have our san san Sacro Sanctum of the Lady, worth 125 points for that unit. And then for our rare units to continue on, our Ballista is only 25 points per model. That's kind of cool. It's only worth 25 points. However, uh, because of the rare uh, units choices, you can only have duplicate units only when you have uh, 3,000 points or higher. So the most you could take are two Ballista for 25 points. Uh, Mangonel uh, is worth 85 points, Field Tribuchet is worth 100 points, and then your Bombard is worth 75 points as well. And that pretty much makes up your army list for this one. Alright you guys, so there you have it. This is my review for the Warhammer Bretonian Army book for the 9th edition rules created by Matthias Eliasson. Um, my overall impression, this is an excellent resource to use, especially if you plan on playing some games of Warhammer Fantasy 9th edition. Um, it's a beautifully created document, excellent rule systems, and it's just a really great uh, product, especially since it's free and you can use it in your games of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. So that's going to do it for this one, you guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us, as always. Also, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to this channel. That's going to do it for this one, you guys. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out, and stay classy.